Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome Sudarshan. Most of you already know him. Uh, he's been a visiting researcher in MSR before. Uh, he's a professor in IIT Bombay, which has an excellent database research group. Uh, he's a co-author of a very popular undergrad textbook, and uh, his research areas include uh, query optimization, keyword search in databases. And today, recently, he's been working on something called holistic query optimization, and he's going to talk about that today. So I'll hand it over to him. Okay. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, so this uh, work was uh, done by, it was started by my uh, PhD student, uh, Ravindra Gauravanavar, or Ravi, as we all call him. And it is being continued by Karthik, who is uh, a PhD student, currently working on this topic. So uh, if there are any really hard questions, I'm going to ask you to email them. <laughs> but hopefully, it should be OK. Uh, and then uh, uh, several master's students, including Mahindra Chavan and a few others. OK. So what is the problem? Um, so here you have a bunch of people waiting for a taxi. There's a long line. And uh, in our context, the taxi is a call to a database system. So you uh, execute a query. You fill the taxi, send it over. It takes a long time to go there, long time to come back. And then the next guy is so there's just one taxi in town. <laughs> so it's a very bad idea to do it this way. And why would you, uh, you know, why would anyone do it this way? Uh, because there are uh, many situations where people uh, code loops with a query inside it. Sometimes it's uh, because the programmer didn't know better. It was easy to change. Sometimes it's actually hard to change because the query is not directly in the loop, but it's deeply nested somewhere else. So um, it's useful not only in databases, but uh, the same problem even arises with uh, web service requests. Our implementation has focused on uh, databases, but the ideas that I present here should be applicable for web services also. So uh, naive execution uh, by iterating over queries is obviously inefficient, as we said. Uh, the latency is a huge factor. Uh, in addition, what we have seen is that uh, with uh, multi-core uh, CPUs at the database, a database can actually handle a lot of queries concurrently, especially if the data is uh, in warm in cache, so there's not much disk I/O. And we are able to pump, uh, you know, ten queries in parallel at the database, and the response time, you know, hardly changes. Maybe when you go to twenty, thirty, th this for small queries. Turns out even for large queries, uh, this kind of works because um, if they share a scan, for example, you can get much better performance. OK, so uh, how do we solve this problem? So a uh, lot of us have been working on query optimization for many years. But unfortunately, there's nothing the database can do. It's being sent a series of queries. And unless it can kind of guess that uh, this is what is happening, but even then, there's very little it can do. Because it, at best, it can pre-compute the query result and keep it. <clears throat> but still, the fetch is synchronous and uh, slow with latency. So you really have to uh, go to the other side of the uh, gap here and work on the application program. So that's something we avoided for many years because we thought we are database people, we are not programming language, we don't know anything about programming languages. Uh, but luckily I had a PhD student who not only knew databases, he also knew uh, program analysis and uh, so we started filling this gap. So as you say, it's uh, time to think outside of the box for query optimization. So uh, we are actually going to give two solutions to the problem I posed. The first one is to use a bus, ecologically sound. Uh, and uh, what is a bus in this context? It's basically site-oriented execution, as you can imagine. We had a lot of fun with these pictures. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm first going to describe our earlier work, uh, which appeared in VLDB 2008, which was uh, given a program which makes uh, calls on a database. Uh, our implementation uh, detects JDBC calls and works on Java programs. Uh, how do you automatically rewrite the program to replace a, a loop with calls by a single batch-oriented execution? 
So uh, the obvious uh, goodies such as uh, set oriented plans, sharing of disk IO, network round trip delays, all, all of those which I told you. So our approach is to uh, actually transform imperative programs. And uh, the way we do that transformation is uh, there are uh, luckily uh, tools available, um, including some at Microsoft, which unfortunately I, I don't think we have access to it. But uh, we are using an open source tool uh, called Suit, which uh, analyzes Java bytecode, converts it to an internal representation called Jimple, and uh, then uh, builds a data dependency and control flow in other graphs, collectively call it the program uh, dependency graph. And now we can, uh, it also provides a bunch of uh, APIs to detect things in this uh, graph. So it makes our life a lot easier to do our analysis using this tool. And it also allows us to uh, move statements around at the Jimple. The bytecode statements can be moved around. Uh, so we can actually transform these programs. So now we have uh, basically transformations applied to the program. And then the second part is to actually rewrite the query uh, to make it set oriented. Uh, luckily, uh, you know, in, in this case, uh, the SQL Server optimizer uh, saved the day here because it's really good at decorrelating queries. So all we had to do was uh, give it a query which uh, essentially used an, um, the uh, uh, cross-join, an outer version of the cross-join, and it did the rest of the stuff for us. Um, so our tests are actually on SQL Server. OK, so here is an example of a program, a small program, and uh, how we rewrite it. Let me see if I can use this pointer. OK, so here is a connection which has been somehow set up, and you are preparing a query which counts uh, the number of uh, part keys from part for a particular category, which is provided as a parameter. And then there is a loop which goes through a category list, uh, stepping through successive elements using next. It binds the uh, question mark parameter to the category, executes it, gets the count, and then adds it to the sum. Okay, so it's doing a fair amount of work, but still a very small example. So here is what uh, we do when we end up rewriting it. So this part is the same. Now here, you will notice there are two loops where there was one. So the uh, key thing here is to split the loop into two parts, where the first part doesn't actually execute the query, well, we'll see that uh, in the asynchronous case, it actually does initiate execution of the query. But in the batch-oriented uh, version, uh, all it does is uh, it steps through the category list. And uh, now, after binding the parameter, it says uh, add batch. And that's all that loop does. And then this single statement uh, does an execute batch uh, with rewriting the query, which, as I said, is very simple. And then the last part is uh, executing over the results of what, uh, this query and adding it up uh, to get the sum. Okay. Of course, we, this all has to be syntactic. We don't understand the semantics. And of course, a lot of conditions apply. You can't always do this. This might be in this particular case. Uh, can't you just issue one query? It's probably harder to discern that from the semantics. In this it's particular category, you could push it as a union of categories and just give me a count of part. Right. Could have potentially done that. Right. It's so much harder to do as well. So there are uh, two kinds of things which should happen. One uh, case is where the category list is actually a list which is in the programming language. It is not coming from the database. And here, what we are doing is this add batch doesn't execute the query. It's actually just collecting all the values, and then this execute batch is doing the whole execution together. No, it's a, it's one query. It's a single query, which is a batch-oriented version of it. It basically takes the parameter and makes a temporary table in the database, and then does uh, that table uh, outer uh, cross left outer cross join whatever on the basic query. Projects out the parameters which went in along with the uh, regular attributes which were in the query. And then that comes back, and this part actually um, steps over it. I guess what I was asking is you could have pushed the sum also into, into the database. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in, yes. If we. But you can't do it so, so that you need to understand what that query is. Exactly. So in this case, uh, maybe we could have inferred that we can translate this to SQL. But in general, you might be doing arbitrary stuff here, order dependent, and so on. So uh, we actually can uh, preserve the order. If the, uh, you know, the, the, this uh, order, I'm not showing it here, but um, the way we do it, uh, this would uh, execute exactly what this loop did in the same order over here. 
and so we can uh, guarantee that if you print stuff out, for example, it still works. And in fact, uh, coming to the other thing, if this thing over here was actually iterating over a relation in the database, which is actually another common case, so you uh, have a query which looks at a relation and then another query inside, then uh, we could short circuit this part potentially and realize that this is already there in the database as a relation and use that relation. We could. I don't think our current implementation does it. Yeah. Uh, often in the program we use RPC context stored procedures for example. Yeah. What happens in that case? Okay. Uh, so if you, um, well, the, in the paper we uh, discuss how we could take a procedure and uh, then rewrite it to a batched version of the same procedure where it takes one parameter, we pass a set of parameters, and we can actually rewrite the procedure itself. It's a new signature in theory. That requires some code changes in the database, right? So you right. Have to right. Uh, so if the code in the database is, again, Java bytecode, this is possible. If the stored procedure is a Java stored procedure, we could do it. But our current tool will not handle SQL stored procedures. So, so a, a, a lot of the, of the latency issue is avoided by, by simply packaging this whole thing up into a procedure, shipping it down to the database and letting that procedure perhaps execute unmodified. It, yeah, and, it's uh, a and, query. And, it's, yeah. it's not a procedure. It's just a rewritten query. Yeah. 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 So, so what, what, you're, you're, what you're adding to that here is somehow driving more of the, more of the execution into the, into the uh, the declarative part of the query uh, that can be optimized? Is that, is that, that too, because uh, we are telling the database to do this query on an entire batch of parameters. The optimizer can now do something intelligent, which it couldn't have if you got individual queries. So there are, that's the second win. The first win is the latency, and the second is this, absolutely. OK. So, uh, I'm going to discuss uh, some of these uh, conditions, uh, but uh, so this is uh, what is this example here? Um, this is a slightly more complex example uh, where what we are doing here is, um, if you look here, this in this case uh, we have a category coming in, and now look at the last part here. It says category is equal to get parent of category. So now, the uh, step here is act after the query execution. So if you split the loop at this point, we actually don't have uh, the ability to get all the categories. So what this example is showing is you can't just take the point in the loop where the query is and split it, because there is a, a dependency here which feeds back into it. Okay, so this illustrates that, uh, well, two things. The first is that uh, if there are dependencies, uh, which are, they call loop carried flow dependencies, so this thing goes into the next iteration of the loop back here, then you cannot split the loop. That's the first thing this illustrates. So that's one of the uh, required conditions for doing the loop split. But the good news is that uh, we can actually do something about it. Uh, there is no reason why this had to be here. Um, we could have moved it up here just before this query. But, but then there's a slight problem, which is that uh, the category which was on which the query was to execute is now getting clobbered. Okay, so uh, it turns out we can use temporary variables and work around this. Uh, we'll see an example. Okay, so uh, there are uh, several steps in this transformation, uh, which, uh, through which I'll show you how to handle complex cases like this. Uh, the first step is uh, obviously to identify which queries we want to turn into batch execution. And in our current implementation, we just look for uh, JDBC calls in there. And I, we could perhaps do it only if uh, there are enough iterations of a loop and so on. But anyway, our overheads are small enough that uh, we can get away with this for now. Okay, so that's the first step. And the intention is to split the loop at this point. But like I said, there is a loop carried flow dependency here, which feeds back into the uh, uh, loop condition and also into this. So we can't directly split it. So uh, we uh, do a, a data flow analysis here to look for this condition. And 
So the third step is to uh, try to reorder statements to see if we can uh, remove this loop carried flow dependency. Now there are certain cases where it cannot be done, in which case we have to abandon it and not split the loop. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, what has happened is um, we have stored the category coming in into a temporary variable, and we have moved that statement uh, get category equal to get parent of category, which was down here. We have moved it up here because there's nothing in between which depends on it. Well, the only thing which depended was uh, this thing. The uh, category was being passed as a parameter to the query. But what we have done here is create a temporary variable so we can use that over there. Okay. So now if you see uh, this resultant loop, uh, there's actually no dependency here. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a lot of conditions. Like I said, conditions apply. Uh, so there are many conditions. One is uh, there are all these uh, functions uh, which could potentially have uh, side effects. But uh, in this case, uh, you know, if the side effect affected one of these things, then we could have a problem. Um, so uh, we can do interprecision analysis uh, to decide this. Um, and um, if any of these uh, ran another query which affected the result of this query, then again we have trouble. So uh, to make sure there's no problem, we actually have to uh, see what are the queries issued to the database inside here. Uh, so we could do static analysis. In our tool, uh, currently, um, you know, we are implementing that part. It's not ready. So like I said, it's faith-based optimization. We trust that um, <laughs> this currently doesn't cause problems. Yeah. One thing is the, uh, the uh, extra conditions on the program. The other thing is on the data, for example, I wonder what if there's null values and, there's, and the query is a slightly more complicated query. Often these transformations are not fully semantics preserving. They, they are same semantics if there's no issues with null values, but once you throw in, and the null values you wouldn't know, they're on the database, this is runtime. Right. Um, I think uh, in this case, it. Uh, that problem will not arise because uh, the uh, outer uh, cross-join definition is that for each value generated by the left side of the cross-join, you execute the query on the right side. And the right side query is the original query. So assuming the SQL optimizer does this right, and I do believe it does it right, uh, we should not have any problems with null values. But you're right. If we try to do the decorrelation ourselves, uh, we could run into trouble. So this is the reason uh, we currently work only on SQL Server. The other guys don't fully implement this. OK. Uh, so I think Sybase uh, does support some form of lateral join. So we were trying it on Sybase, but it's not yet functional, as far as I know. OK. So uh, in this case, uh, after this move, uh, the loop carried flow dependency is gone. And uh, there are gory conditions uh, for uh, to check if we can split a loop at that point. Um, I won't get into all the details. But the last step is how to split the loop. In the earlier program, I uh, sugarcoated a lot of stuff uh, to make it easier to understand what was going on. But this is actually what our transformation does. Uh, so the first loop did something. Then we executed the query. Now the second loop should do exactly the same set of things as the first loop did. Of course, what happens inside the loop is different. But uh, if there's a variable which was in, defined in this loop and was used down here, uh, then we better preserve the value of that variable so that when the same iteration of the loop is done over here, it sees the same value for that variable. So uh, if, once we split the loop, we have to make sure that variable states are saved and then restored down here. Okay? So in order to do that, uh, we create this uh, loop context table. And this has entries, one entry per iteration of the first loop. And the second loop simply goes over the same entries in the same order in which they were created. So it's really more of an array than a table. So uh, what we do here is create a context. And um, in this case, uh, let us see. Is there any, I think there was no variable that needed to go into the context. Uh, so uh, the context was basically used um, because the original query execution here, uh, well, let me go back to the first slide to show the original query. Okay. So if you see here now, um, 
in, in our earlier uh, program, I sugarcoated it by saying the query just returns one value. But in general, the query may return multiple values. And you might actually be iterating over the values here. In this case, I, I, you know, we have uh, removed a little bit of the sugar coating and we say result set dot next because there's just one value, but it's getting that. But if you had a loop, then we have to make sure that in the second part of the split uh, loop, we will be able to execute the same thing over there and it would get all the results of one particular invocation. Okay? So that's uh, part of uh, what a loop context uh, oops, can do here. So um, when we uh, do an add batch, we are setting a context. So which iteration of the loop was this for is uh, provided by the context. And here, we are saying result set equal to uh, statement dot get result set on the context. So we'll get exactly the same result set that the corresponding iteration over here would have got. And then the rest is the same as before. OK, any questions? So the last part is uh, how to do the uh, uh, batch rewriting. So this is uh, the uh, SQL Server syntax. Um, so over here is the original query. We have created a batch table. And then we have to insert all the values into the batch table. Um, we can use uh, the uh, batch form of the JDBC uh, insert statement so that we don't do multiple round trips, or we do only a few round trips. And then here, uh, we select uh, batch table one dot so those are the parameters and then all the attributes of the query from batch table one outer apply and then over here is the query and finally we order by um, loop key one so that the output of this comes back in the correct order so we can just go through it in sequence we don't have to go back and forth in it. Must be times when the sequence doesn't matter though, right? Mm, the I mean, this final final ordering. So this ordering is on uh, not of the query. If the query had an order by, um, well, then what would happen? You'd have a two order by. So we would do an order by loop key. And then within the loop key, whatever order by was there for the original query. So uh, the, the point is there are many queries issued. We want the results to come back in the same order in which the queries were issued, because there is a loop there. Maybe it prints out the results. So the results have to come in the same order there. Might be some loops though, where, where that doesn't matter, where, where you wouldn't have to do that. Yes, um, so that could be an optimization where we turn it off. But unless we know for sure that the order doesn't matter, we this is safe. Okay, so that was an overview. I didn't go in, like I said, I didn't go into all the details of the conditions, but uh, we have. Uh, those in the uh, BLDB 2008 paper. And the uh, more detailed version is there in Ravi's uh, PhD thesis. OK, but there are some limitations. Uh, well, a limitation is an opportunity for a new paper. So anything which you didn't do in the first place, you get one more paper. So that's what we did here. And, and then I'll tell you some of the limitations of So this was a paper published in ICD. And well, that also has some limitations, which will be our next paper, hopefully. OK, uh, so uh, the first limitation is uh, we were doing batching. And uh, there are obviously many interfaces which don't give a batch, the ability to do a batch query. So um, we have to do asynchronous submission. That's the only way for these things. The second problem is uh, for certain programs, the query may actually vary across iterations. And so then what query are you batching? Our batching assumes that across the loop, the query is fixed. Sometimes people add a few selection conditions depending on what uh, parameters came in, and the queries vary. So uh, we'll be forced, uh, we, we cannot do batching as is. Um, and then there are uh, some uh, interstatement data dependencies, which might mean we can't actually split the loop. Okay, so maybe we can't uh, apply our transformations. And um, finally, uh, like I said, even though we may not be able to batch, uh, the uh, uh, multi-core processing power on the client can be used to issue a number of queries in parallel and uh, you know, also fetch them back in parallel. Uh, so at least the, whatever work the client has to do can be parallelized. And similarly, at the server, whatever it does can be parallelized, even if it's not site-oriented. So uh, basically, we exploit asynchronous query uh, submission. Uh, so in order to do this, uh, 
by the way, our original uh, batching uh, did a whole bunch of low-level uh, calls and added a lot of code in there. So one of the problems was uh, when we saw a rewritten program, we couldn't understand what it was doing. So uh, you know, uh, like I said, uh, trust us to do the right thing, but uh, would you trust our uh, programs that much? You, we do something and then you run it, well, you won't be happy. So what we ended up doing is uh, building an API so that uh, our transform program uses the API and is a lot easier to read. So uh, the programs which I showed you uh, actually are based on that API. Uh, the original one was actually much harder to read. And the other thing is that once you have this uh, API, if you don't trust our rewriting, you can still use this API and do whatever we would have done automatically. You can do it manually and get the same benefit. And finally, uh, there's an improved set of transformation rules. I won't be getting into that, uh, including reordering and so on. So what we are doing in this thing is to have a whole bunch of taxis. So I had one question in the earlier method, yeah. the bus method. Um, it seems it should be very hard to find, to argue that any transformation that you have is correct. Right? So for example, I can imagine some extremely subtle uh, dependencies if you, for example, use uh, system time or if you use randomness in the code. Yes. How so, do you even find out that you, know, that you could have such certain dependencies and, and not enable your transformations for those cases? So uh, we are assuming that the procedures which you call are not going to have uh, such side effects. So if, um, yeah, it's because we are reordering the way in which you do things. So if you had a procedure which was in the first part of the loop and a procedure which was in the second part, Earlier, it would have been, they would have gone in lockstep. Procedure one, procedure two, one, two, one, two. But now it's one many times, then two many yeah, times. I, I, so absolutely, it'll break. If they have side effects, the whole thing will break. No, no, but my question was more about how do you know that you won't have any side effects? Okay, so there are two parts, right? If we do a full-fledged inter-procedure analysis, we could actually see what those procedures do and make sure they don't have side effects. Uh, our current implementation doesn't do that fully. Uh, the reason we don't do it is, uh, at least with the tool we are using, it's very slow. The problem is that it doesn't just look at our procedures. It starts and uh, it goes deep into all the system libraries which are there and starts analyzing the, all the libraries, which is crazy. Uh, so uh, we need a better tool which will just look at our procedures. And for the system things, you know, there's already a contract about what side effects it has or doesn't have. So really it should work at that level and then it would be efficient. Because the time is taken per procedure is not much. But the problem is it goes into all the libraries. So our current implementation doesn't actually do that. So we are assuming whatever procedures are there are side effect free. But the remaining parts, the dependencies within the loop is what we are actually making sure is okay. Okay. So the motivation is uh, obviously asynchronous submission can improve performance, and it, it is in fact widely used. AJAX is very widely used. Uh, it's also true that it's very hard to program in AJAX. Um, so uh, it's okay for simple stuff, but if you want to do more complex things, uh, you need a bunch of uh, very smart programmers, and your average application programmer is not that smart. So one of our uh, goals, in addition to what we have been doing, is uh, to uh, take an application which would run at a client, uh, your uh, tablets or whatever, uh, or your browser, and rewrite those, so JavaScript or whatever other language application, and turn synchronous calls into asynchronous calls. But we are not there yet. We would like to do it. Okay, so asynchronous, uh, you all know what this is. I'm going to skip this. This was for a different audience. By the programming yes. Asynchronous may not be just queries. Yeah. So the programming, uh, actually, not the the web services community has uh, certainly studied this. Obviously, it is important for them. Uh, but whatever work we have seen has uh, focused on straight line code. So if you have a sequence of calls, then they would do prefetching or, or asynchronous submission ahead of time for that thing. But if you had a loop, then uh, whatever techniques we found do not work. So uh, database people uh, tend to do loops over some data and execute a number of queries. And that is something which the web services people somehow have not paid attention to. But for the uh, straight line case, indeed, there's been work from quite a while back, 2003, 4 even, there's been work. Uh, 
So uh, the ICD paper had the following contributions. Uh, like uh, in the batch case, it automatically transforms the program. Uh, there is a statement reordering algorithm, which is applicable both to the batch and to the asynchronous thing. In the earlier paper, we uh, didn't have any guarantees. It was like a best effort. Uh, later on, we developed an algorithm which could guarantee that wherever a reordering was possible, which could allow us to split a loop, it would, in fact, do that. So there's a corresponding theorem uh, in uh, Ravi's thesis in detail and briefly mentioned in the paper. I won't get into it. And then there's the API, as I said. And um, uh, we also talk about some of the uh, design challenges in, involved in making this happen. Yeah? You also look at um, uh, uh, counteracting the inefficiencies that the programmer may have added in his code. For example, hmm. he may not have added, a, say, a top K or limit clause in his query, but hmm. you can look at the program and realize that uh, he really only wants the subset of results, so you can actually push it down. That's a nice idea. But thanks for <laughs> suggesting that. We have not done it. Uh, it would be, yeah. <laughs> <That's a laughs> Redirect. <laughs> okay. So uh, the, the, here's a, uh, basically the same program as before. Uh, this time, what we have done is uh, we have a handle, which is for uh, queries which have been submitted. Uh, the handle is used to actually fetch the result from that. And what we do here is instead of uh, adding the query to a batch, we do a submit query over here. And the submit query immediately returns a handle, which we save in this handle array. And then the second part of the loop simply goes over the uh, different handles. It does a fetch result on that handle, and then finishes up the loop. Again, this is uh, simplified to work for this program. The actual rewriting doesn't look like this. We do have the loop context and all that in there. But conceptually, this is what happens. So uh, conceptual APIs are execute, uh, submit query, uh, execute, uh, uh, sorry, execute is a blocking one, which is split into a submit and a fetch. Yeah. So how many are you going to initiate? Right. So that is a parameter which we can control as part of a configuration. So the uh, submit query actually doesn't directly go and send the query. It simply adds it to a queue. I think I have a picture here. So submit query simply adds it to a submit queue. And then there's a bunch of uh, worker processes, threads over here. So we can control how many there are. Uh, I believe the uh, current uh, version of uh, the ADO.NET actually has an asynchronous query submit. Uh, we are not used it as of now. Because, well, our tool is JDBC, so we don't have it. But if we did it in the .NET framework, we uh, could have perhaps avoided all this and used that uh, asynchronous submission. OK, so, uh, so each of these threads is synchronous. It blocks till it gets the result back, and then uh, puts it in the result array, and then it's fetched over here. OK, so uh, what do we have here? This is the uh, same thing uh, as we saw before. Uh, the challenges are the same as before, complex program with arbitrary control flow, uh, data dependencies. Uh, loop splitting requests, variable values to be stored and rest. These are all the same problems that we had before. Um, I didn't explicitly list all of them before, but uh, let me say a little bit about what we do about some of these. Uh, the data dependencies, I told you, there are conditions for when we can split it. The second issue is what about uh, control dependency? What if there is a query which is conditional in there? Uh, how do we handle it? So uh, we use a fairly standard trick, which is uh, to turn uh, any uh, uh, thing which is inside an if uh, into a guarded uh, statement. So we uh, have a, a variable which stores the result of the if predicate. And then each of the things within the then part is guarded by the, uh, that variable being true. And then the else part is guarded by that thing being false. So now we have these guarded, individual guarded statements. And the control uh, flow is basically gone. Um, so conceptually, we do everything. Of course, we would skip the else part if we are doing the then part. Um, but in this case, uh, we pretend that all the guards are actually executed. Uh, the thing is, when we uh, finish our transformation, there is a second stage where we take the rewritten code and get it back into uh, Java. So at that point, we actually go back and create uh, if then else is back. So the final program uh, actually doesn't, uh, it, it hides all those details. 
ok. So, uh, we uh, give here a few of the rules. Uh, now, there were similar rules for batching, um, but I will um, focus on the rules which we use for the asynchronous part. Uh, the first one is the result, uh, the equivalence rule for loop fission. Uh, the second is to uh, convert control dependencies to flow dependencies. This is the one I told you with the um, if then else this can be turned into guarded comments. And then uh, rules C1, C2, C3, which allow reordering of statements. Um, again, I won't give all the details. Um, but these, uh, some of these generalize the batching rules, and some of these uh, simplify the batching rules. So I'm going to skip the details. That's a good question. Uh, so uh, where we would have used a variable and then uh, reused the same variable in the next loop, we are actually storing a, a loop context object which stores the old value of the variable and keeps it along till the second loop. So certainly there's an increase in the state. Uh, but the thing is, um, how much will this blow up? Right? If you had a thousand iterations of the loop, you have a uh, you know, thousand fold blow up of the state. Now, if, Typically, what we have seen in this program is the state is just a few bytes. If you had a very complex state, yes, then that could be trouble. And if you had uh, data structures which you are updating and so on, um, which are also used in the second part. So the thing is, if a variable is not used in the second part, we don't have to save its state. So it's only for these things which cross the boundary. So uh, if you have complex data structures which cross the boundary, then we are in trouble. So we won't actually split the loop in that case. But as long as it's simple variables uh, whose value we can save and restore, we do it. Now, my condition is that the number of iterations of a loop is not going to be large. If it were, uh, let's say, 10 million, your program would never have executed. Try doing 10 million round trips to a database. Uh, your program wouldn't have executed. So it's not something we need to worry about. No, but it, it could be an issue in the, in the asynchronous So in the asynchronous case, um, uh, since uh, we have, um, uh, you know, we, we can control what is sent and when it comes back. So that can be under the control of the API. The submit part simply spews out the whole thing. So if the result is large, we can actually uh, stop sending the queries uh, to, we don't implement it, but there's no reason why we can't do this. That, uh, you know, we stop sending queries at some point, wait for the, uh, the thing submitted earlier to be consumed, and then send more things. Isn't that true for the variety of the loops there? I mean, you, could, you could simply pound the number of iterations of the loop and, and uh, sort of package things up in batches yeah. in order to avoid having to materialize. Yes, uh, that is true. Uh, so we could, uh, uh, the rewriting would be a little more complex. So you'd have uh, an outer loop and then an inner loop for uh, per mini batch. So we could do it. And, also, uh, they nicely lends itself to like column source style compression, right? Most of the time, these are going to be very simple. Uh, say variables, for example, get incremented by one, or many variables might remain the same across the loop. Mm. It's not like some arbitrary changes that are happening uh, in the loop. So, could also compress it like uh, It's possible. We have not explored it. Yeah, if we realize that a variable is simply a counter, then we don't actually have to save its state. So those are optimizations which are possible, but not currently implemented. Okay, so um, this is, uh, well, I actually pasted uh, two talks together. So there is a little bit of repetition between the batch and this. So I think this particular one is the same uh, loop uh, carried dependency. So I am going to skip this part of the slide. Uh, but the thing to note is that when we did the earlier paper, uh, the reordering algorithm was not complete. It was just a, uh, you know, say that you can move this and then if it uh, resolves the condition, then you can do the rewriting. But there was no uh, specific algorithm to say, you know, what should you do, how should you do this, and what order do you do the reordering. So one of the contributions in this paper is an algorithm which decides uh, when you sh can move something, and amongst the candidates, which one to move, and it actually does this iteratively, uh, 
till either till it cannot move anything uh, till either the condition for splitting is satisfied or it cannot move anything and it gives up okay. so uh, this is an example of uh, the dependency graph uh, so this is a little bit of the inside story of what happens uh, so these are the statements corresponding to this thing over here uh, now again uh, over here we, this is a java program so the statements here are Java state uh, lines, but that's not uh, what the analysis actually does. Uh, we have something closer to bytecode, and those are the statements here. But uh, sticking to the Java statements, uh, we are uh, treating um, uh, S2 as these two together, and then S3 is this, S4 is this. So look at, let's look at some of the dependencies. Uh, the uh, black ones here are the flow dependencies. That is, um, S2 uh, is defining a variable over here, it writes to a variable count, and S3 uses it, so there is a direct flow dependency. Uh, then there are other kinds of dependencies, there are uh, anti-dependencies, so over here there's an anti-dependency from S1 to S4, because um, S1 is reading something and later S4 writes to it, so those are the anti-dependencies. Uh, then there are output dependencies, in this case uh, the uh, is, well, the dashed ones are loop carried, which is across iterations of the loop. So over here, uh, the assignment to category is clobbered by the next loop, which also assigns to the same thing. So that is an um, output dependency, but it is loop carried because it's in the next iteration. So we have a dotted red arrow here. Similarly, um, uh, if you see here, category is assigned here, and then uh, in the next loop, the value of category red is whatever was assigned in the previous loop. So there is also a flow dependency which is now loop carried from S4 to S4. So this is the uh, kind of things which we get in our graph. I, I will uh, skip all the minor details. But uh, finally, uh, you'll see that from S4 to S1, there is a uh, loop carried flow dependency which goes from the second part of the loop back to the first part because this assigns it and that reads it. So those are the ones which prevent splitting and that's what we get rid of by reordering. And we've already seen this particular example of uh, creating a temp variable. I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, but let's see the same thing in terms of uh, what happens to the graph. So what we have done is uh, added a new statement S5, which is the temp thing over there. And S2 has been rewritten to use the temp so over here, there was a loop carried flow dependency from the second part to the first part. Over here, after uh, doing this reordering, you will notice that uh, the part where we want to split is this. S2 is over here. This is the execute query. We want to split the loop into a part which is before it and a part that is after it. And here, there is no such dependency going back. And therefore, we are able to split the loop. Any questions? So uh, there is a statement reordering algorithm. Again, um, it takes as an input uh, blocking query execution statement and uh, the basic block, which is the loop itself. And um, wherever possible, it reorders the basic block such that no loop carried flow dependencies cross the split boundary SQ. And of course, program equivalence is preserved. So that's the formal definition statement of what it does. Um, and uh, again, there are a lot of details here. I will probably not get into all of them, uh, but I will just give you an idea of what we are trying to do. So basically what we want to do is uh, we want to find a statement which we can move to some other place in order to get rid of that loop carried flow dependency. That's our goal. Uh, so uh, the first step is uh, to identify statements which we want to move. Um, so uh, in these two cases, there's a v1 with a loop carried flow dependency to this, and in this case, this, again, there's a v1 which is over here, um, which feeds back over here. Now, the second part is where the loop carried flow dependency is uh, from the query itself to something earlier, or from the query to something later, which in turn has a thing going back. So these are the various cases. So uh, we do. We move different things around in the different cases. We won't get into all the details. 
so the thing is to decide what to move in each of these cases. And then we have to see what other statements depend on the one which we want to move. Because if we move something, something else may get affected. So we have to move it carefully. We can move a set of statements together in some cases. Um, so uh, in this case, we identify everything which is dependent and move all of those past target. And uh, finally, the, uh, the statement which, well, um, the dependent statements are moved past target first, and then the statement itself is moved past the target. Because if we don't do that, we are splitting the loop there. So uh, this is the last step. Once we move statement past, we can now split the loop. OK, so um, a true dependent cycle in the data dependence graph is a directed cycle made up of only the flow dependencies and the loop carried flow dependencies. And the theorem is that if uh, a query execution statement doesn't lie on a true dependent cycle, then the reorder algorithm is uh, successful in moving things around. So this was a guarantee which you didn't have in our earlier paper. And in the ICD paper, we have the algorithm which guarantees this. Uh, the good thing is that pretty much all of this is applicable to both blocking and asynchronous. And in fact, our API cheats. We have just one API, and then we have a flag somewhere which says, do it as batch or do it asynchronously. Of course, the API looks weird. Uh, we say add batch, when in the asynchronous case, it actually goes and executes it. Uh, but the nice thing is that the transformations are identical. The API is identical. It's just a flag whether you want to do batching or this. Of course, in certain cases, you cannot do batching, in which case the flag is set to asynchronous only. Okay, so uh, that is a quick view of what are the kinds of uh, things we do to rewrite the program. Uh, and this is a overall uh, flow of what we do. Uh, we take the source Java file, uh, parse it. Uh, well, we use the suit framework, which does all of that. Converts to the Jimple representation. Data flow analysis also, and def use information. All of these, the dependency graph, all of this is done by suit up to here. This part is what we do. Apply the rules to move things around. The thing is, once we move a statement, everything changes. The dependency graph itself changes. So uh, after we do any such move, uh, we have modified the Jimple code, so we actually have to again do the data flow analysis so that the uh, dependency information is correct after the move, and then we can again apply more transformation rules till we uh, decide we are done, and then we decompile and get the target Java out. So this uh, API, uh, like I uh, said, um, can be uh, auto-generated, or it can be manually uh, used. Uh, so there is a loop context uh, structure in the API, which makes it easy to remember all those variables which were defined in the first part of the loop and used in the next. And the same API for batching and asynchronous. So this uh, was demoed at ICDE also. So that is a quick overview. Now let's move to the performance, whether all of this is worth it. Uh, so the uh, batching uh, performance, there are a number of results earlier. Uh, I won't use all of them, but uh, one or two of those are presented here. So what did we use for doing our uh, analysis? There were uh, two public domain uh, benchmarks. Um, there was two real-world applications, uh, which uh, one of which a company was having actual performance problems for a real application. Uh, so they had built it in a modular fashion. Okay, so modular fashion means everything is an object, uh, and you have to give a stock option to an employee. They have a set of procedures which deals with one employee. And now stock options are generally given as a batch. You give it to a number of employees. And it turned out that in their application, uh, they used a really expensive computer with uh, uh, you know, uh, plenty of memory and everything. And in spite of all that, uh, they had a window in which they sh had to process the uh, stock uh, grants, and they were running out of that window. Uh, so uh, they came to us, and uh, it kind of uh, came out well, because we had already been working on this problem. So that is a good connect. Did you include yourself among those who got the stock grants? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> no, the, actually, that company turned out to be very clever. Once we gave them the idea, they said thank you and <laughs> went away. So the idea was we would work with them for a while and develop it. Uh, but I don't know what they did. Whether they used our idea and said bye-bye or whether they decided not to use our idea, I have no idea. Okay, so uh, this one, as I've already told you, is something developed in this area. Um, so we uh, used a dual core machine, but even with dual core, uh, we are actually uh, getting a lot of benefit from having multiple threads. Uh, there are also some experiments on PostgreSQL. The asynchronous part we can do on Postgres, although the batching transformation is a little trickier. Uh, so we uh, look at the impact of various things, such as iteration counts, the number of threads, impact of warm versus cold cache, um, since I.O. is a big issue. So one of the things we thought is if we increase the number of threads, there would be uh, more I.O.s happening, which would destroy the uh, normal sequentiality of a single execution. It turns out that we thought performance would actually become much worse. But surprisingly, uh, you know, it didn't become much worse with either of these systems. Uh, that depends on the query. If you're doing a point lookup, it doesn't Yeah, for a point lookup, it does. But the, so we actually, so this is what happened first. So we said, okay, let's have a query which does a lot more work, a scan. But even then, it didn't matter. So I think the databases are fairly good at controlling the load internally. Okay, so here are uh, these things. The, uh, there are two things which are uh, cold cache numbers, and then two which are the uh, warm cache numbers. This is SQL Server. Um, so over here, uh, the original program with four iterations, you can see that the transform program is actually running worse with cold cache. And with warm cache, uh, the difference is even more. You can't even see the original program down here. So uh, the bottom line is when the number of iteration is very low, the batched, uh, well, which one is this? This is the, I think this is the batched one. Oh, no, this, sorry, this is the asynchronous one. This is with threads. Okay, so it actually becomes worse, potentially. But if you see, the time was actually very small anyway. So, uh, you know, tenfold increase doesn't mean very much when it's uh, 10 milliseconds. Uh, but as the number of iterations increases, uh, you can see that uh, the transform program, like here, this is cold and uh, this is warm. Uh, you can see that uh, the transformed uh, program was like nine seconds when the original was 50. And in this case, uh, it was uh, 5.9 seconds when the original was uh, 46.4 seconds. So the improvement is substantial when the number of iterations is more. Now, this was with 10 threads. So, so yeah. it doesn't matter because the, for the uh, small number of iterations, because the runtime is so small anyway. But yeah. for throughput, it does matter whether you are 10 times more resource intensive. intensive. So I wonder whether you can kind of, you have it introduces a new estimation of prediction problem, but based on the program, not on the database, or maybe on both. Could you try to predict whether you are in that yeah. uh, sweet spot on the right, or whether you are in the other case on yeah. So um, uh, Ravi is actually working on that. I have not been involved in that part, but uh, he's been working with some other programming language people to uh, try to do static estimation of the number of loops that you would have, um, either static or maybe dynamic uh, based on previous runs. Yes, so we need that. We need to do some cost-based changes. Uh, the other thing is I'm not sure that uh, this... Uh, Decrease in performance is because the database is necessarily uh, much more inefficient. It may just be the overhead of setting up an asynchronous call and fetching it. So it may not have any impact at all on the database. It only impacts the yeah, client. Server, for yes. You run this in an app server. It matters if you are yes. 10 times more secure intensive. Absolutely. Okay, now this one is uh, seeing the impact of the number of threads. Uh, with one thread, well, uh, we were at 46.4, and the time decreased sharply. Um, it starts leveling off after five. It, it improved up to uh, somewhere around here, 30 or 40, and then it started increasing again. 
Uh, so uh, experiments were done with uh, 10 threads. It would have been slightly better maybe with 30 threads. So maybe some of that impact. Uh, but for the four iterations, it wouldn't have mattered. How does it matter whether you have 30 threads or four? It's all the same. How many processors? How many processors? So the uh, database server, I think, was a dual core. Uh, that is here. 64-bit uh, dual core was the database server machine. And the uh, uh, client, okay, this doesn't say, but I think the client was uh, just a single core. Even it's dual core, it's hyper-threading. You can have many more. Yeah, I think it had hyper-threading. That, that's, uh, yeah, it, I'm pretty sure it had hyper-threading. So it probably was the equivalent of four cores, at least. Um, what else? OK, that slide is done. Now this is a web service where uh, we coded this manually, because our code does not actually recognize web service calls. And um, again here, uh, something which took almost 180 seconds. Uh, by the way, the database was Freebase with a web service API. And uh, up to about 25 threads, you can see there's improvement. It started leveling off after this. So there's a lot of potential for this. Now, uh, how, what about batching versus asynchronous? Uh, if both are applicable, how do they compare? Sometimes only asynchronous are applicable, so then this is not relevant. Uh, and if you see here, the first is the original, the second is asynchronous, and the third is batching. And as you can see, batching, wherever it's applicable, it pretty much outperforms asynchronous. It's fairly clear. The number of uh, messages you send over the network is reduced. The database can use a better plan. So you should use batching if at all it is applicable. But if it's not, asynchronous still gives a substantial improvement. OK, so uh, that completes the talk. There are many uh, directions for future research. Uh, the one which we are currently focusing on is this. Uh, so whatever I showed you was a query in a loop. Now, this works for certain applications, but there's a whole class of applications where the query is deep inside a procedure. So any application which uses, say, a Hibernate framework, um, it hides the SQL underneath. You just see an object model, and you invoke a method on the object. And deep inside, it's either doing a SQL query or it is uh, looking at something which has, has already cached. If it brought the object over, it's looking it up. Now, in this case, what can we do? If you had a loop over multiple objects, you uh, and whatever you're doing actually required running a query to fetch an object. We, well, we would like to have prefetched those things. So uh, we can't do the exactly the same kind of uh, you know execution of the query um, asynchronously like we did, but what we can do is, um, if we recognize that inside a procedure, so here is a loop outside, here's a stack of calls, and deep inside uh, uh, a SQL query may or may not be executed. But let's say it's likely to be executed, and we know what the query is, and if we can trace the uh, way in which parameters are passed down, so that the parameter to the query is actually available up here in the stack, we can actually issue a prefetch all the way at the beginning. And then we don't touch the second part. We are not splitting loops. We are not doing anything. So this is what is nice about the new approach. We are uh, very non-intrusive. The earlier one actually did a lot of program rewriting. Now the only rewriting is to issue prefetch calls. So that's uh, work in progress, which is coming out uh, quite well so far. The second one is which calls to transform. As Gerard was saying, we need to uh, do, uh, to figure out how many loops are there and then decide whether to split or not. Um, minimizing memory overheads, uh, there were some suggestions, optimization, certainly. How many threads to use? So our experiment showed something, but is this always the case? Maybe it depends on the load at the database server. So if it's already heavily loaded and you start throwing a uh, lot more work on it, you may be causing trouble. Um, and then you're not actually using it immediately. So can we control this in a slightly more sensible manner. Um, and the last part is actually quite interesting, transactions, with uh, both Dave and Gerard here. <laughs> so this is a big issue. Uh, we uh, swept several things under the carpet. Uh, the first thing which I swept under the carpet is, even for the simple read-only case, uh, 
each of these threads actually opens a fresh connection to the database. And now how do you guarantee that all of these are running under the same transactions? So it turns out that uh, in theory, you can use the XA interface to uh, make all of these part of the same actual transaction. But it also turns out that uh, many databases don't actually support this feature. Mm. So it's a bit of a problem. So where it is supported, we can use it. Well, for some reason, you might in fact want to have uh, separate transactions uh, and uh, not, not in fact uh, have this, the database run long, long transactions, but rather run a bunch of short transactions instead. Yes, so if that is what you want, then we are already doing it. We are ignoring uh, the effect of t taking one, what used to be one transaction because it was one connection. Well, if you used auto commit and each one was independent, then there's no issue at all. Yeah, yeah. You need to preserve the semantics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, oh, oh, sure, of course. And yeah. even with versioning and so on, once you open several transactions, it's no longer yes. the same effect. But, yes. but most of most of most of the so-called default transactions are a transaction per statement, which right? so every time you send yeah. something, although you get another transaction, that's sort of that's that's the default unless you do something explicit right. about it. So that case, uh, you know, we do handle as long as it's read-only. If you do updates asynchronously and things go out of order, you're in deep trouble. So we obviously don't uh, issue a, uh, updates asynchronously. So it's always safe to turn a, a bunch of disparate transactions into one big transaction, but it could have some bad effects on Yeah. So if you're, uh, we, we, we can, uh, since we have access to the API, uh, we can easily figure out whether your original program ran under a single transaction. So in that case, we uh, take all these connections and try to shoehorn them into one transaction. But like I said, uh, it uh, appears not to work uh, quite right on the databases we tried. So it's, we have not been able to get it running so far. Uh, so with versioning, that's another. With snapshot isolation, with read-only, it seems like a natural thing to say that here are all these connections. Let them all use the same snapshot. Now, if the database decided to support this, it would be completely trivial. There's no overhead for the database to do it. But we need an API from the database to allow this. OK, so that's it. Any other questions? So, so one of the things that interests me, I used to have a background in compilers and optimization. And, and, and I think an interesting question is to what extent the the kind of program transformations you're doing might be of use, whether or not you've got a database program down at, down in the bottom of the of, of the loop of some size. What sort of what sort of conditions can you put on the things, and what sort of generality can you can you can you do to in fact get get program transformations, which which might affect other other scenarios as well as the database scenario. Yeah, that's a good question. It's indeed something we thought about. Uh, so the first concern was uh, maybe all of this had already been done in the programming language community. And so we just use it and substitute, uh, you know, uh, add statement is substituted by a JDBC call. Uh, it turns out that uh, these are very high overhead. You know, setting up loop context and so on are very high overhead. This is not something that any compiler writer who is sane would ever put in in order to save a few cycles somewhere else. So most of what we do makes sense only if whatever you're doing is expensive. Uh, so that is something they have not done. But the specific uh, analysis for uh, loop splitting and so on, that has some similarities with uh, uh, you know, the uh, parallel compiler uh, world where you want to take something which is multiple iterations and then turn it into a parallel execution. So some of that analysis is very similar to what happens in parallel compilers. Thank you.